that's the better. Uh, we we'll, we we'll, like zooming in between or like changing. No, don't change. So like the slides are visible, yeah, yeah. and this is what it is. Just leave it like this. Don't okay. change because it closes up sometimes. So we're cool. live. So you're ready to start whenever it's one o'clock. Uh, how do I start? Like it's just already let, just let them know that okay. I'm ready to go. Okay. All right. Just okay. one more question. Yep. Can you? Oh, okay. I'm already doing it. Okay. <laughs> Okay. But put the earpiece in your ear so you can hear a response. Okay. All right. And so you like can wipe it down. How many of these are the earpiece? This is the one, right? Yeah. This, this is the clip. earpiece. This is the mic. Oh. Okay. Okay. And you just press down this button to talk. Got it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, we're two minutes to the top of the hour, we'll get another two minutes and we'll get you off. Yeah, we stop. Okay, take off in another two minutes. And uh, if anybody feels that uh, they need to be during it, uh, we won't be offended. So, I think that's more people doing it. So, it's on the way up. Share. That's okay. All right, okay, let's get to talk. Uh, hey, welcome everybody. Um, I hope you enjoy our talk on how we build managed services at Red Hat, at least our flavor of it. Um, we get kicked off by just telling you a little bit about ourselves and why we have some experience to be able to talk about the subject today. Uh, David as well, David French, uh, yes, it's about to real, and I have five years of experience building managed services in my path. 
very similar journey to David's. I worked originally on the mobile SaaS platform, Red Hat application, Red Hat mobile application platform. We built the Red Hat managed integration, and then over the last two years, I've been working on what most people know as Managed Kafka or OpenShift Streams is the uh, marketing name for it. I have uh, I was a principal software engineer. I'm the team lead, the OpenShift Streams team, uh, team lead in the previous managed services I worked on, and the uh, managed application services architect. Most recently, I moved into people management and. Uh, about eight months ago, where I'm now the hearing manager for the same control plane and mass security teams of the open stream operation. It's probably worth mentioning myself and David did work together as engineers. He's a trainer, so uh, it's, it's kind of, I don't know how many of those together here. Uh, we should, uh, I think we should put days together, which is about it. Okay, so to kind of set things up, uh, maybe a few. It's a long mission long, so let's make sure it comes out the same way. So that's the client we need on the service, first of all. So it's just something that provides a not static contact for users. It's the API that the user don't care what's right behind the service necessarily. They just want to do something with the API. And when we say a managed service, we're talking about uh, in terms of like a cloud service. Uh, and ultimately, what we need is some sort of managed service to manage by the Because the users, because our customers are interacting with this, uh, with this API, they expect some sort of contract. So there's a level of agreement and service level. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Great. So uh, the customers expect some sort of level of agreement to work contract uh, because they're paying for this service. So that's, that's what we're talking about. And in terms of the level of technical knowledge required for this topic, uh, it, it's, I don't think there's a terrible amount required, but if you do have experience with Kubernetes, that is a bonus. Touch on a couple of Kubernetes terms. And if you have run anything in a production environment where there are users, where most users can somehow raise issues against the service that you're running in production, uh, you should hopefully see some uh, similarities here too, and be able to draw some knowledge. But hopefully that sets the context, and uh, yeah, we'll get something from this. And so we're going to break it down into a few logical areas. Uh, David, do you want to say a bit about them? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so. Here's what we'll be talking about today, and I think I said, right, the level of knowledge for this. We wanted to uh, set it at the, the level of knowledge that we could give it to, give this talk to a very broad audience that maybe doesn't have as much experience to some of the concepts. And what that means is we're going to talk at a very high level about all of these different areas, from architecture, the security, to billing, to deployment best practices, and continuous deployment, all these lovely things. And you may be looking at this and maybe you don't experience building managed services, but you do have experience building software and you might say, hey, hold on a second, but these things apply to me and you're not wrong. So there's a lot of overlap in terms of what it requires to build a managed service versus what's required to build a managed software today. And we will touch on each of these things. We only have 50 minutes for this talk. It's going to be an F15 going past a few houses is the level of detail that we're going to be able to give in each of these subjects. But the intention behind this is that you will hopefully use this as a jumping board. If there's a topic that you enjoy and talk about, you can deep dive into that yourself. There have been other talks during this conference that have deep dived into these specific areas. For us today, we're going to have to stay at a pretty high level uh, for the amount of time that we have. How do we know if you've done a good job in this one? That's a good question, David. Hey, what do you leave here with? So, uh, hopefully, everyone will leave here a good sense of the amount of work that goes into creating a managed service. But we don't want you to feel overwhelmed. It's, yeah, that can happen. We want you to feel like it's achievable um, with, with the right help, of course. Uh, we want you to understand that working with others is important for achieving a larger goal, such as a managed service. So, every organization, every group, every team. It's going to be different, so you need to find some implementation that works for you. And 
So this is how we do it in managed application services group in Red Hat. Uh, there's going to be some things that work for people, some things that don't. So find what works. So the first thing, architecture. And just before we get into architecture, one of the core aspects of this talk, and what we'll touch on throughout it, is to have a customer-centric mindset. Again, this applies any software that you're building today, but especially for managed services. Put yourself in the shoes of that customer. Think how they're thinking. How will it impact them in what you're doing today? That comes into architecture. One of the first areas that we need to explore as part of architecture for your managed service is tenancy. And then ultimately tenant isolation or noisy neighbors. And then things like how do we capture the architectural decisions that we've been talking about? So let's keep into let's go on to the next slide. Let's talk about tenancy. And this this may differ from what people are familiar with with building software for uh, customers that are deploying it themselves, but what is a tenant? A tenant is a customer. And when we talk about tenancy, we talk about the deployment model for your managed service. Single tenant is where a customer has an instance of your software that is isolated in a dedicated environment. <clears throat> so let's take, for example, uh, for us within OpenShift Screen, the service instance in this case would be a Kafka cluster. And in a single tenant environment, that Kafka cluster would be deployed to an OpenShift cluster where there's no other customer's capture cluster to apply to that same open chip. Still managed by Red Hat. Still managed by Red Hat, right? And if we break that down, what do we really mean about the, the fundamental building blocks when we talk about isolation, we talk about tenancy, but we're talking about resources, we're talking about compute, CPU and memory, we're talking about network, we're talking about storage and database, and it's ultimately about tenancy is really talking about whether there's those underlying resources are shared between customer instances or not. And there's pros and cons to all of them. So in a single tenant environment, a single Kafka cluster for a customer is applied to a single open chip Kubernetes cluster, and a second customer will get their own dedicated environment. What's the opposite of that? A multi-tenant environment. So in that scenario, resources are shared. You could have, I'm not sure if people are familiar with Kafka here, but Within Kafka, you have topics uh, where you produce and consume messages. So in a multi-tenant environment, what that would look like is you have a single Kafka cluster, and each customer would get one or more topics in that one instance of Kafka that they produce and consume messages against. Now, what does that mean? Well, now you need to deal with isolation. You need to make sure that customer A can access the messages on a topic from customer B. Right? So these are the things you need to think about when you're thinking about your architecture and you're thinking about tenancy. There's, there's pros and cons, and it's completely dependent on your use case, which one you're going to choose. For single tenant, the pro really is it's easier, right? You don't have to deal with that isolation between tenants, but it's going to cost you more. If you have an open shift cluster, you're going to have master nodes, you're going to have infra nodes on which you're dedicated, and in that scenario, you're going to have that for each single service instance that you're applying on behalf of the customer. So it's going to end up costing you more than a multi-tenant instance. And we call the mixed tenant where some of the resources may or may not be shared. It's kind of a broad range. And this is the model that we use within OpenShift Streams today. And how we do that is we have a fleet, several OpenShift clusters that we call our data plane. And we uh, deploy customer Kafka instances together on each of those clusters. So what that means is a customer has their own Kafka instance that they don't share with another customer, but it applies to the same OpenShift cluster, meaning the underlying resources are shared between those Kafka instances. So there's some isolation, it's a mixed model, right? Uh, next slide, please. So then to talk about how we deal in it, specifically for our scenario, for mixed tenancy, how we deal with isolation. And again, coming back to those uh, fundamental resources, the network, the storage, how we handle that, we use some Kubernetes and OpenShift concepts. So we dedicate worker nodes on a cluster to specific Kafka instances. And what that means is the compute, the CPU and memory are not shared between separate Kafka clusters for different customers. Where's the network here? So network, so that's a good question. The network is shared and it's, it's scaled dynamically, but I won't think that right now. Uh, but what we don't share, we don't share ingress with the uh, standard cluster. So if you're hitting the console for an open chip, 
Uh, we have separate ingress controllers for all of the traffic to all the CAP instances that are applied. But that network is still shared uh, between all the CAP instances that are on OpenShift. How we handle that is we have quotas. So we have a max data transfer that can hit per CAP instance. So it's fairly standard that we know if there's X number of CAP instances, how many ingress controllers we need based on load testing and scale testing that we've done. And the last one, separate storage. So each CAP instance will have their own storage. There's no shared storage uh, in any CAP instances. Perfect. Right, so, um, in a world where you're, if you're working for Red Hat or another company where maybe you're not building one managed service, maybe you're building two, three, four, you have a sweep, a fleet of managed services that you're looking to build, you think about architecture, how do you reduce duplication? How do you reduce duplication across all of these services that you're building so that you don't have all of these different engineering teams in a large enterprise that are all solving the same problem? It's a waste of effort, is it not? A couple of ways that you can solve this, and a couple of, for other APIs, the API contract definition is an open API spec, which is a source of truth, and that's hosted in the Swagger line and all the rest of it. You automatically generate SDKs for that. How does that reduce duplication? All of the API consumers can use the SDK rather than implementing their own logic for calling out to the endpoints that are necessary. And it also means as soon as we uh, have as soon as we change the open API spec and bump the version of it, there's a new SDK auto generated and released that can be consumed by those clients when they need. In terms of order to reduce duplication, there could be a common functionality between different managed services. If you think about things like um, authorization, there's a great talk from uh, Gigi and Alex uh, just an hour ago, or uh, two hours ago on, on Authorino. That's an example of where you can have another shared service for handling these common pieces of functionality, such as polarization between other managed services. What about code in billing? How do you know if a customer signed up to your managed service and how many of these service instances they're allowed to create? Well, when we think about, well, oh, is that a library? Should it be a service? Fairly easy way. This shouldn't be the only thing you take into account. But the easiest way to think about it is whether it's stateful or stateless. And in that scenario, when I talk about quota and if you're allowed to create a service instance, that's stateful. And there's different managed services that may need to find that, request that information. In that scenario, a shared service makes more sense than a library. But there's other common scenarios of common functionality where a library may make more sense. And lastly, on architecture, and this does not just apply to managed services, if any of you take one thing away from this talk, Please use ADORs, but uh, what they are. So, we all, as engineers, as part of the industry, we make architectural decisions daily, weekly, monthly, whatever it may be. That's great. Uh, maybe we document them, and maybe we don't. But the thing is, is maybe in a year's time, or even there could be another engineering team within your company that might want to find out what architectural decisions you made, and not just what, why. Why did you make that decision? And why did you discount alternatives at the time? Because I guarantee you, if I came to any one of you a year after you made that decision, you better memory than I do, that's the purpose of ADRs. It's not just to capture the what, it's to capture the why and have that historical decision log for all of your architectural decisions as part of your service. For you, I will benefit everybody else in your company. Uh, okay, so we've we define an initial architecture and we're going to get onto the uh, So we're not, we're not doing more of just going to make that clear. We're going to keep coming back to architecture again and again. We're going to keep going through development cycles. Let's say we know what our initial architecture is going to look like. Um, let's see, what kind of development best practices should we start with? So application. How do, you, how do you change configuration without having to do a new release of your service? Is it possible for your service to scale? Little to no manual action needed. Does someone have to get paged when you're reaching some sort of limit? And do they have to manually go in and scale up something? Um, you want to avoid that if at all possible. Let's try to push this back in the development cycle so we're thinking about that uh, right from the beginning and continuously as well. So, how do we make our own? all tolerant from day one? So, a few, a few technical examples in Kubernetes. The first uh, is just multiple replicas. So 
earlier, let's get your plots are also uh, increase the number of replicas. Your app does need to be stateless uh, to be able to do that. That's the first thing. But building on that, use multiple AZs, multiple availability zones in in the uh, in, in the platform provider. So uh, this is just a failure domain annotation. So my plot will only get scheduled uh, certain material time. If there's a red convert Instance of my pod scheduled on this particular node that is this particular failure domain annotation, it doesn't mean that I'm so excited somewhere else. If that AZ has some failure, I know that to move pods in to keep things going. Another example of how to be fault tolerant uh, is using this thing called a pod disruption But uh, This helps with things like uh, Kubernetes node upgrades, where there's no drain happening. Uh, you can specify, for example, uh, the minimum number of available pods in this particular pod. So if, it's, if Kubernetes is about to drain a node, and that is the last instance of a particular pod you have this set, it's not going to kill that pod. It's going to wait until there's at least one instance of that pod running somewhere else. Then it will come on. And so there's a few things we can do. Just quick one on that, like, and that story of fault tolerant is a part of how you solve uptime during underlying cluster upgrades. Because as we talked, as they talked about at the beginning of an SLA, a customer has an expectation for you for different service level agreements, and they will talk about SLOs and everything in a bit, but um, you need to be able to upgrade your application, you need to be able to upgrade the cluster, but then Acting the customer service in any way, shape, or form. And that is a part of what they were just talking about there. So, I think a good kind of indicator that you might need to rethink it is if you need to schedule upgrades and tell the customer when the upgrades are happening, that you should be thinking there, okay, why do I need to tell them? Is there going to be some downtime? Okay, can we, can we stop that downtime? It's a bit of a shift. I should mention that there's nothing new with what I'm saying here. These are just examples of Kubernetes. This all goes back to uh, the idea of a like, 12 factor app. Uh, I'll have a link to the bottom of some of these slides here. If anyone wants to check that out after, but it's, it's, a, it's a fairly common way to have applications. So, earlier in the process, how do you allow for scale? So, uh, you know you want to scale at some point. Should you do that up front? Yes, that's pretty much the answer. You want to try and build it into that scale. Okay, you want to eliminate that toy, uh, to use that SME term, that possible uh, manual intervention. That is just to avoid adding a one on value where somebody needs to come along and manually scale. So you can specify an initial capacity for storage. Uh, there are ways to do like auto, so within, within some limits if you want to specify. So I can only list these volumes. Kind of, and it might, it might kind of hit uh, up to 10 gigs for most customers, but sometimes the customer might push that to 100 gigs. Uh, get out of that, that scale. But beyond that, then you have a so that scenario, I'm going to have a conversation with the customer. Uh, compute memory requests and limits. Uh, I don't have an example here, but that's a very common thing to specify in your Kubernetes deployments as well. So do you use them? There are some caveats where priority can trump that. Uh, this is something to kind of be aware of. There's not a Kubernetes cluster that could, could just completely take over the, uh, take over the CPU. Uh, if anyone wants a good example of that, you can take a really good example of that happening in production with uh, some of the other here. So, uh, scaling node size and adding extra nodes. And, this is probably this is probably drawing on some stuff we did in open ship streams because of the scale of Kafka clusters that we're bringing up. Three, six over six over Kafka is that kind of thing. Uh, we need to have some slack capacity to allow for new people bringing up Kafka clusters. Uh, but sometimes a lot of people come along with great clusters and we need to make sure to add new nodes uh, to allow for that capacity. So we're doing that now. We need to write that into our in this case, the option of 
network. That's just a touch on our quick day. Yep. Just the alternative to that is that you already have the nodes in place, which means you are paying money to your underlying cloud provider for whatever those nodes are. So it's ultimately cost effectiveness to be able to scale at least work our nodes and the fleet, all different story, up and down based on demand, that otherwise you're leaving money as part of your main service, which you don't want to do. I think you touched on this already today. Network, that's, that's very difficult to control. Uh, kind of, uh, at least have that plan. Do some testing, do some local testing on your service to get an idea of when, uh, when the network trooper kind of reaches its limit and have a plan in place for what you do about that plan. So, uh, I think in the case of uh, the camp guy, there is a way to limit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, see, it's going to be different for every type of uh, tenancy model and every type of model. Uh, so, there are some development best practices. Uh, another important area is observability. I don't think I'll do it justice here, but I will you know, a few important things that we can bring earlier into the development of the service. Uh, so, a few things to consider here. So do you know if your service is doing what it should be doing? So can you look at your service right now in production and say for certain is doing what you expect it to do, what users expect it to do? Do you have those signals in place? Can you look at data and say users are not experiencing the problems? Sometimes customers will raise issues, sometimes they might not. It's not a huge issue. But in those kind of uh, mid-grand scenarios, can you pick those can you detect them and see that there's some kind of edge cases have potential? How quickly can you find the root cause of the issue? So this is all you need to interpret. Answer those questions. Positive answers. So some observability fundamentals here. So uh, it's all about knowing the internal state of your service. Uh, in the case of Kafka, you also need to do it. Uh, the network trooper, for example, you can get some metrics and say, okay, so this, this many bytes of data that is this much. Okay. Um, there's a de facto stack that we use in services today, uh, as it's on Kubernetes and OpenShift. Uh, we tend to go with Prometheus metrics, Grafana, uh, for dashboards, uh, uh, Manager, and data driven for perks. Uh, so, very standard. Out of SRE, you can read that you have uh, a lot of SREs, but it's not yet uh, very valuable. Uh, but so we try to adapt that SRE mindset as early as possible. Uh, do that, one of the ways we do that, we try to define these things called service level indicators. They are signals that correlate to what the users care about. So in case of Kafka, what do users care about? Cross partition. Uh, so can we can we get some signals? Ah, the answer here is yes, but there are kind of questions we can think about. Building on that, to find some objective ground. So we're going to going to uh, embrace this. We're going to accept failure. It's going to happen at some point, and we're going to be okay with that. And we're going to say we're going to be okay with that within some bounds. Ninety-nine point nine five percent. Rest, whoever small or large it is, saying that it has potential. It can be okay. If you can detect that turning towards reaching, you will then alert the SRE to do some preemptive. This, this, is, this is the theory behind it. In practice, it takes a long time to get to that point. This sets you on that journey. Error budgets. I mentioned this. Mention yeah. a little bit for error budget. Exactly. So the people in this audience may not have heard of or be familiar with SLIs and SLOs already. And I guess the easiest way to think about it is that an SLI, most people are familiar with APIs and availability, is your indicator would be the response codes 
per request. So whether it's a 200 is successful or whether it's a 500, that's your indicator. And then the objective is that you want 99% of requests to be successful in K200, right? That's probably the easiest way to think about what an indicator is and what your objective is. The indicator is just a metric, and then the objective is what you're aiming for uh, for a customer. What are the 300 supporters? Uh, <laughs> uh, we don't, again, no, it's a good question. The time servers are not going to take that into account. Just for trust that. You, of course, you have to trust it. We don't, uh, we don't create both, right? It's all a perfect code. <laughs> Everything is a five Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, error, which is, uh, yeah, when you have those objectives, you can use that to read the You have that in place, you can agree on an error policy uh, across the various teams. It's not just the engineering team, the SRE team, the uh, support team, the engineering team. When we breach that error budget for a particular 28 day period, what have we said we would do? And in, in, in the case of the guy, it's uh, uh, engineering you to stop what you're doing, maybe not stop what you're doing, and they need to prioritize some work that tries to fix that. Yeah. Um, have we ever had to do that? Again, we don't introduce both, so. Let's <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have we've done some problems, we have our observability pieces in place. Make it uh, get this out to our clients. We want to work on some continuous deployment uh, across the environment. So how long does it take for a change to go from merge, so a pull request to be merged, to be available in some environment by dealing with that? As small as possible, the caveats there. Want to trust that it's not a break as well. And um, does your development environment look like your production environment? I seem like a simple question, but in a lot of cases, uh, that might not be the case. You should fix that. Does your pre production environment look like production? So, in other words, local data looks like uh, your stage in your pre production, and looks like your as much as feasible, I guess. You're not going to bring up the tree open chip across the board. So what do people do with that? Sorry, is that a question again? What, what do people do for local environment if they need uh, like a control um, it's So it's a good question, I and mean, it's not the easiest thing, but specifically for open chip streams, in that scenario, we will stand up an open chip dedicated cluster, but we will deploy both the control plane components and the data plane components to a single cluster. So not for, for Yeah, and it's again one of the awkward parts about just limitations of the compute that's on your machine, and depending on the size of your managed service, you may need to uh, stand up some hosted cloud environment to be able to do that. But it depends. If you're, you're talking about the whole stack, right? If I'm dealing with an individual component. Absolutely, I will run it on my local laptop. And for most things, I will point to the production environments of things like SSO and think other uh, services that we integrate with, like OCM and things like that. Okay, but ultimately, what we want is the ability to move fast safely. That's the important bit, it has to be safe. And uh, we want to allow for motion between environments. So, the little visual at the bottom is just kind of what it's have your local development environment, so I have my staging, and then other people want to get into production. How many of these steps are, are automated? Ideally, the creation of the PR, that's manual, a developer has to come along and create some changes of the PR. And then someone needs to someone needs to approve it so it gets merged. Yeah, that ideally those are the two manual. Continuous integration should run all your tests and so on. I continue to find it after merge to place your stuff to stage. When you move out, how much risk do you have? A couple of other things. 
they're going to create support tissues and they're going to, you're going to lose customers because of this. So whatever you do, don't move fast and break things. Don't follow that saying, of, like, just don't do that. This is a service that people pay for. There's a contract. This is a thing called a service definite. And that's the contract with the customer. It's what they expect from your service. If you do something that kind of hears from that, breaks it that bad. So I'm, I think the easy way to explain that, right? So we have Excel ID data we talked about. We have the objective to save the company 99%, and we are going to pay you back X amount of money. That's the agreement, and that's the contract that our customer signed with us. Just, just to highlight the SLA, actual people bit, it's customer signs. That is a different thing than service definition. What they do for this type of reference set, if I remember right. And the service definition goes into more detail. If it's not in the service definition, then you can't go back to the service. You can save the service to the future. If I want to go to the slides. Yeah, do you want to just the slides? Yeah, it's like a little bit of a like that at the beginning. It's, it's not like that. Think about it. What we do within Red Hat Pro is turn into automatic services. Okay. Our service yeah. definition is called for. Oh, we have to say, you want to be able to do this, that there's some problem. No, not this room. That's the other one. You're a user because you're accepting that whole term and condition at that point. Okay, so we're not going to move fast and break We are going to move fast and deprecate. So that's where the deprecation comes from. Users do not like to mess with that. So deprecating comes from that. Use versioning to help with that. So the Kubernetes style version you can use, where it's like uh, uh, email alpha, email beta, etc. And they mean very specific things in Kubernetes code. You can break stuff. Um, or there is center, where it's major or minor by touch. And again, Changing those numbers means something very specific. So you can, as much as possible, with a service, you want to do a practice of that. Particularly with Kafka. If you change something that you can't go over itself, there's clients out there that are really old using some old protocol. And you break that with a new version of Kafka, you have to go to the front end. So, next area, security. All right, time for a scary topic. Um, it's not easy to build a managed service because you are responsible for the security of your customer, of the service that you're running on their behalf. Two general aspects when we talk about, again, this is high level, you could do thesis, you could do everything you would want to on security, but we're, we're touching on it at a high level. And broadly, there's two aspects of security when you think about managed service or a lot of software. You think about your compliance, and then you think about vulnerabilities that are either part of your dependencies or within your surface area of your APIs themselves. Let's talk compliance. Um, well, what do we mean, right? I think everybody's familiar with the word, and there is two different types of compliance. You will have some compliance for managed services, web services in general. And then you'll have compliance that will allow you to either sell within a specific industry or within a specific region. So things like that, right? um, that's a type of cloud compliance that will open up a governmental, US governmental agency you have to meet this compliance before they are able to purchase your managed service. So well, what happens if you don't have the compliance? You just can't sell to those customers. For the other compliance, cloud compliance, there's 27017, which is a standard laid out for cloud service providers, CSPs. Um, that doesn't necessarily open up new uh, areas of customers, but some customers may look that you have this compliance before they would even consider purchasing your managed service. And then for industry and geographical compliance, we think about things like HIPAA. I think most people that are from the States will be familiar with this, not cloud service or managed service specific. But this is the type of compliance that you will need to meet if you want to sell your software within the healthcare industry. So I think like the baseline there is data center needs to be HIPAA compliant. Right. And then the cloud provider on top of that needs to be HIPAA compliant. And then your service needs to do things to HIPAA compliant. Right, right, right. So that, that one's very tricky. 100%. That is none of this stuff. This is what I'm saying. This is one slide of things that you can spend weeks on each one of these things individually. If you were 
to look at what's required for FEDRA, <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, then the last one in terms of regional compliance, GDPR, which I think most people are familiar with these days around data regulation. If you want to make your service available within Europe, um, uh, within the EU, then you need to be GDPR compliant. I believe there's also something in Australia where your data cannot leave Australia whatsoever. The discompliance, I can only imagine how much of a headache that is for some SRE to to book stuff and look at logs. Yeah, do you have to have, have a VPN to some machine? Right. Can you do it on that? Yeah, it sounds, it sounds like you're heading to me. So, uh, so then, vulnerabilities are, I think, what most people are familiar with. And like I said, there's two different aspects of this. Um, there's the surface area of your APIs in general, because when people hear about CVEs, generally they are found against more popular libraries and things like that. Uh, but what can you do specifically for your APIs? You can do what's called trip modeling. And what that is, is we're lucky within uh, Red Hat, we have a full product security team. And what we've done for our OpenShift team, OpenShift Stream service, is we have we have, uh, we work with the product security team that we've defined our architecture, they've reviewed it, and we've identified what threats are possible against their APIs, and then we will call for resolutions depending on the risk of whatever the potential threat may be. So, so do you mean for each APIO, each architectural decision record, someone from product security is actually looking at that too? That's a great question. Uh, so what we've done is initially with our full architecture once it was defined, We've gone over with them, but for each new ABR, we will ask the question of does this impact the architecture enough to go back and revisit the initial threat model? So incremental changes are okay. Yes. <laughs> a good question though. Um, so then CV resolution. So everybody in the room is probably familiar with the words, and maybe people will uh, uh, get a little jolt when I say the word log for J uh, <laughs> or log for shell. Um, and that's what we mean by CV. And that was probably one of the most serious ones, recent memory at least, that allowed, so for those that are not familiar, there was a vulnerability within the, the Java logging library that allowed for remote execution on a server that your application was running on while using this dependency. Uh, pretty serious, right? And what that meant, it was fixed in the library, there was a new release and you had to update it, and that's ultimately what CD resolution is for you your dependencies, the libraries that you include as part of your application. Um, but that's why you need to care, because if you don't even have anything in place to resolve them for your dependencies, you're potentially leaving your whole managed service vulnerable in different ways. So there's tools out there that will do that. There's Pandabot from GitHub, there's, there's Sneak, and there's other things that will inform you for any of the libraries that are affected by different CVEs and will tell you what version you're fixed. Like this, is, this is a whole thing. The whole business is around this on, on how you can solve it. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, the last few topics are uh, pretty small, so I'll, I'll quickly go through billing. Um, David wants to explain escalation on the initial planning process. But billing, from an engineering perspective, which we are, uh, you may ask the question, why do we care about billing? Well, there's two types of billing. Either a customer will pay up front for a, a sediment or they will pay after the fact. Think of an electric bill, meter billing. Like this. Um, for uh, for upfront, let's keep the first part. But for upfront, let's not worry about it too much. But uh, let's talk about consumption-based pricing because that's what's important for engineers. Because it is tightly coupled with observability. Because you need to ask the question you know, how do you know what your customer has used? So somebody has made a decision that we're going to charge on data transfer, storage, maybe. Cluster hours or how long cluster is enough, but you need to use that's accurate. You can't just say, ah, I'll use this, I'm sure that's close enough. You need to be accurate, otherwise, the customer's not going to be happy. And that's tightly coupled to observability to determine the usage for a customer's Kafka cluster in our scenario where we do uh, charge on true like storage and cluster hours. Support and escalation. So we're getting closer to seeing our service in production here, or imagining all the issues that will happen, all the incidents that will happen. Uh, 
Uh, so if something goes wrong for a user, who finds out first? That's that's an interesting question. So the correct answer is you find out first as a person who wants the service. You want to get to that, but that's that's not how you answer first. Does everyone in your escalation chain both their responsibilities and all the else is in that chain? Uh, so we have the support team as a first line of first line of support team. Who do they contact if they can't solve the issue? And there's various ways. So, do you understand the layers of support? There's the service that you, that you build, there's a platform that sits on top, and that is its uh, uh, and there's an infrastructure which uh, in All those different parts, all those different areas. How do you root issues and analyze? Who is your mission? It's a whole system. How to determine which you should take? So uh, it gets even more complex where you have a tenancy model for a part that is managed by one SMT and another part managed by a different SMT. And maybe there's some escalation path in your way. Have you executed? How do you practice that? Google's teams know that uh, exists. All these questions. Uh, so learning from support and estimations is really important. So understand the roles of your teams and the outcome of each issue and estimation. So what I mean there is whenever there is some sort of instance or some sort of issue, it should be a sign that there's probably some some failure, small, large, whatever. What's the evidence? Is it an uh, update to your document? Is it, uh, is it up with the service itself? Or is it, uh, is it just some infrastructure? Have a retrospective with prioritization of actions for each, each issue, like uh, various stages in particular, each incident. Prioritization is not stressed out. 100% agree. Like, what's, what do you get? If you don't, if you don't have a report analysis, it's fully consumed. Engineering are required to prioritize the fix or whatever is causing you to solve it. A lot of these issues in support installations. Fire drills, they're great for finding various gaps with these escalation paths. Uh, uh, we have this, this uh, new thing happening now that's getting a team behind it, which is good. Which the real way here is this uh, champion called, called, called these combat sessions. So originally named after uh, Kafka, sort of came as well. Okay, uh, but we're going to roll it out for other services as well. So, what does the session look like? You have some scenario that you that you kind of set up with your service where something has gone wrong. The various people on that team would have support, docs, SP, engineering, and they may not, may not know what issues happen. But you have someone acting with the customer saying, "Hey, I'm seeing this particular error from our client," and then checking the there. Uh, most difficult thing as an engineer on one of these calls is actually to stay quiet. I'm just showing you how uh, I've, I've tried really hard and that's right. Uh, so, as an engineer, you have to imagine the support issue has come to the support person, to the support engineer. You're not there, you're not going to be there in the future. So, to shut it out, uh, eventually, you will come back to. Those fire drills are excellent for teasing that. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, unfortunately, we have only two minutes left. Um, but for all the engineers on the uh, that are listening to this talk, I'm sure you don't want your web time too much. But it is important. Uh, so I'll very quickly give a quick overview. The one thing that I will say is agility, the ability to switch, change priorities in a quick manner. Talk about Scrum that has sprints two, three, four weeks. It's about customer retention. Because if customers have requests, if there's bugs that you need to solve, being agile in the way that you plan and prioritize your work will help you to retain your customer. This isn't about managed services, this is about building software, right? This does not pertain to it at all. This is a topic that 
course, that was a whirlwind. And I'm saying, again, it's the tip, it's the tip of the iceberg for all of the topics that we touched on. There's a lot of overlap with everything that we touched on between managed services and just developing software. What we talk about managed services, that means mean, this is a story where we build managed services, specifically around open chip streams and other managed services in Red Hat. So use what do they want and do that whether you're an engineer, whether you're a quality engineer, product management, whatever it may be, we all need to be in that customer mindset from day zero. Do we have time for questions? Um, five minutes for questions. Any questions? We have one, we have two. We got his hand up just beforehand. I think we got to walk up to the mic. Orderly queue, please. Uh, on one of the earlier slides, you said deprecate fast, don't break things. How long do you leave something deprecated for you actually? Yeah, that's a great question. Our current deprecation policy is uh, set that we say six months um, is how long we will leave the old API run for. Um, I'll be honest with you, we haven't been the best at that. And we have skirted around it a little bit while we had maybe a few like before when we had just internal customers and the ability to talk to them, but don't do what we've done. Have a deprecation policy and stick to it because that will allow all engineers to understand and reinforce that that's what it's meant to be. But nothing, you have the deprecation policy now because of that scenario. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's what the goal is, right? Don't do what we have. I'm sorry, we don't make goals. Sorry. Like, what's our unique spin here for managed services? Because there are a lot of vendors offering managed services. Are, uh, are there any examples where, you know, AWS or, you know, Confluent, somebody's offering really great example of these managed services? Yeah, perfect. So, just to, to make sure I understand the question, what's the differentiator for OpenShift Streams among competitors? Is that a question? Um, so, it's a really good question, right? And, we're still very much in the early stages of building managed services at Red Hat. And uh, we, have, uh, we have a lot of experience with building our managed services here, but there are other market leaders. We mentioned Confluent. That's a big market leader in the managed capital space. There's other ones, there's MSK, Amazon, um, other cloud providers that other operating. The intention behind Red Hat with our hybrid cloud strategy is to have a suite of services that customer can use. We're not just offering them managed infrastructure with OpenShift and other things, but we're offering them the ability to transfer data with Kafka. We're offering them the ability with service registry for schema with connectors to be able to use a connector Kafka cluster to external services. And then there's other ones that are coming up as well, but it's really the differentiator with Red Hat is to be able to build a suite of services that will allow customers to not only use infrastructure, but really get a application to production at a uh, quicker. Good question. Uh, just one more, please, just one more. Okay. Well, we appreciate your time. Thanks very much. If you have any other questions, please don't be afraid to talk to us afterwards. I appreciate your attendance. Thank you.